The sermon is a God-centered life. A God-centered life. Joseph had a God-centered life, and that's the kind of life we ought to have every day, always, as Christians and as a church, a God-centered view of life, a God-centered view of uh, our role for our place at Lone Oak Baptist Church. And best thing we can do for Brother Will and Sarah as they prepare to come in view of a call is for us to get really close to the Lord, pray as Jeff and uh, prayed today for God's perfect will in all things, and for us to have a God-centered life. You know, you can have a man-centered life, that is a human-centered life, or you can have a God-centered life. Uh, so you may, so you may have a God-centered life when everything's going well and saying, praise the Lord, but do you have a God-centered life when trials come? Do you have a God-centered life when you're tempted? Do you have a God-centered life when you have to forgive someone? Joseph had all of this, and we're going to look at five intersections in Joseph's life. We're going to cover uh, 14 chapters. That's going to be a short sermon, isn't it? Now, we're going to not do every verse, but uh, the life of Joseph, and I'll just lay a, a, maybe a devotional opportunity or challenge on you to take the time to read uh, the story of Joseph, Genesis 37 through 50. More is written in the Bible about Joseph than almost any other character other than, of course, our Savior, uh, Moses and David would probably have just as much, but Joseph has more than any other person uh, in, that, other than those. There's nothing bad said about Joseph. Well, I can't say that about myself. Can you? I can't say that. No one could ever say anything bad about me. They could find a lot of things bad about all of us. The only other man in the Old Testament of that way might be Daniel or Job or Noah, uh, but Joseph had so much written about him, never anything bad said about him. Joseph and Daniel, I once said in a sermon that there were two men in the Bible in the Old Testament uh, that about whom nothing bad was said, Joseph and Daniel. And after the sermon, one of my deacons there at First Baptist uh, came up to me and said, Brother Roger, my name is Joseph Daniel Garrett. His wife said, yeah, and he's never made a mistake either. But <laughs> what a great two names to put together. Joseph and Daniel never did anything that we have written wrong in the Bible. Joseph had a God-centered life. As we're coming into the Easter season, it also is wonderful to think how God miraculously plans our life before the foundation of the world. Joseph was the most Christ-like figure in the Old Testament. And if you take the time to follow Joseph's life and match it with the life of Jesus, the parallels are not a mistake, not a coincidence. I want to read 10 parallels by way of introduction. Both Joseph and Jesus had a long-anticipated birth. Uh, Jacob wanted a child by by Rachel for years and years and years, and Joseph was the first child of Rachel. Both Joseph and Jesus were their father's beloved son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Jacob loved Joseph as a beloved son. He was It was the favorite son, no doubt about it. He had the coat of many colors, the long coat. Both Joseph and Jesus were sold for silver and falsely accused of foul crimes. Joseph's brothers were jealous. They sold him to the Amalekites, Midianites, and sent him down to Egypt. And Jesus was sold by Judas for 30 pieces of silver and were falsely accused of foul crimes. Joseph there in prison were falsely accused of foul crimes in Egypt and put in prison. Both Joseph and Jesus had special garments that were stripped away and returned, dripping with blood. Isn't that amazing? Joseph was prisoned with two malefactors, one of whom was forgiven, the other was not. Jesus was crucified between two thieves. One was saved, one was lost. Both Joseph and Jesus came back from the dead. Joseph figuratively and Jesus literally. Joseph bore the scars of his imprisonment. The Bible says that the scars of those chains when he was in prison were in his skin. Jesus bears the scars of the cross uh, in heaven today for us. Interestingly, both Joseph and Jesus, the Bible specifically says, were 30 years old when they began their public great ministry. Joseph became the savior of the world in a physical sense by delivering them from seven years of famine Jesus is the Savior of the world in a spiritual sense, saving us from our sins. A God-centered life. 
Do you and I let God be the center of our life in all things? Do we, as was read a moment ago, in all our ways acknowledge Him? Isn't that great? That's how you have a God-centered life. Every turn of the way, acknowledge God. I'll give you another challenge. or opp- I love to call it opportunity. You know, an opportunity and a challenge are kind of alike. Take a, a marker, maybe a yellow marker or a pink marker where you can still read the words. I did that this week in preparation for this sermon. I used pink. So I've got a pink letter edition of the Old Testament for Joseph. And I went over in pink, just like you have a red letter sometimes in the New Testament of the words of Jesus. And every time Joseph spoke, I marked it. And through his life, every time he spoke, after he was sent, put into prison and uh, sent away as a slave, you have all these chapters. Every time he spoke, he talked about God, no matter what. That's amazing. Isn't that wonderful? We ought to, do, we ought to be like that. I just think God's in charge of everything. Say amen. amen. God's in charge of who we marry. God's in charge. I remember when I, I worked, uh, this is, I'm chasing a little story here, Roger Freeman uh, autobiographical story. I, when I was a teenager, I worked as a cook at Waffle House. Amen. I still like to go to Waffle House. I just sit, th- I think it's an art form to be able to be a Waffle House cook. Say amen. It's not easy. And, but I loved to work there three years. And uh, after I got out of high school, worked there every summer through high school and every Saturday. And the people there got to know I was a preacher. I was a preacher boy. And uh, when I met Priscilla, I said, God's given me the woman he wants me to marry. And they all kind of looked at me like, huh? What does God care about who you marry? And that was a good opportunity to witness. God cares about who you marry. God cares about your life. God cares about getting up, you getting up in the morning. God cares about, I, I, I think we ought to pray about everything. I used, to, I used to pray every time I'd go to Clarksville Memorial Hospital or to go to Vanderbilt or wherever. I'd say, Lord, give me a parking place. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hey, why not? What's bigger little to God? Joseph was like that. Every thing in Joseph's life was a God thing. One other story by way of introduction. We'll jump right into this study, and I won't take long on every point, I promise. Uh, As a new pastor, I had many new experiences. I'd never had to tell anybody that they'd lost a loved one until I was a a young pastor in my my mid-20s. And this was before cell phones, many years ago. And we got a phone call at the church from the family of Lorraine and Gordon Adams, two of the, my, one of the greatest deacons, great lady in our church there were in our first church. And they said, we're trying to reach mother and daddy. Their son, Jimmy, age 52, has died of a heart attack. Oh, can you go and find, I think they're out shopping for antiques. They love to go to antiques sh- shops and we have an a antique in our home that B- Brother Gordon had uh, repaired and fixed. And we still have it in our, in our home. What a wonderful, sweet, gentle Christian man. And Miss Lorraine was a Sunday school teacher. By, lo, knew the Bible better than anybody. But knew the Bible better than I did. Guarantee you. And Jimmy is dead. So it was a Wednesday afternoon. It was right before church. I got a couple of deacons. And they knew, one of them knew where the house key was. And we went inside their house. We knew they'd be coming home for dark. And we sat there, and we're in their house, and in walks Gordy and Lorene. They already knew, recognized our face. And Miss Lorene said, something's wrong. What's happened? And I, for the first time, had to tell someone they'd lost a loved one. I said, Miss Lorene, your son Jimmy has had a heart attack, and he's died. Now, what you, what's a person going to say when they're hit with that Mack truck spiritually? You know what she did? I'll never, ever, 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 ever forget it. She just stood there as if numb. She said, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. And we sat her down on the couch, and she said, the Lord is good. That is a God-centered life. Amen. Heartbroken, but in the midst of it all, She knew God was in charge. Let's look at the life of Joseph. The first quality of a God-centered life is a God-centered heavenly vision for your life if you're taking notes. 
uh, heavenly vision for your life. In Genesis 37, 9, Joseph is 17 years old. And uh, Joseph uh, had the coat of many colors. Look at verse 3. Joseph was the, uh, he had uh, 10 brothers older than he. He's the little brother. Benjamin is going to be also the younger brother after him. And his brothers were jealous of him. But it says in verse 5, Joseph dreamed a dream. Now, let me say quickly here, God does, and I, I say this, and I know some of you are going to argue with me, but I'm going I'm to tell you the truth. God does not speak through dreams today. He speaks through the Bible. Amen? Okay. A lot of danger when you say God's going to speak through a dream. Now, in the, before we had a Bible, God did speak through dreams. Your dream is not the Word of God. God speaks through this Bible. God speaks through his word. Be careful. A lot of things out there you'll hear on TV or radio or whatever about this or that, some other, maybe even these visions of Mary people are having and Mary speaking. No, that is not Mary. No, it's not the word of God. This is the word of God. Now, having said that, Joseph was in that day before we even had a written word, and God did speak. God was giving a prophecy through Joseph. Joseph was a prophet. Even at age 17, he dreamed a dream that the sun, moon, and stars and the 11 brothers knelt down before him. Now, this was fulfilled when he became the prime minister of Egypt after they sold him into slavery, and they did bow down to him later in chapter 45. He did become the savior of the world in the sense of having all the food ready for the seven-year famine. Also, I don't have time to go look it up, but it mar right in your margin by chapter 37, Revelation 12, it's a prophecy, or rather a, a fulfillment of the prophecy, of the sun, moon, and stars, which symbolized Israel, and how out of Israel came the man-child, Jesus Christ. So Joseph here had a vision given to him by God, that he was going to be used to bring the Messiah to the earth. That's the whole story of the Old Testament, isn't it? I will bless them that bless thee, bless thee, curse them that curse thee. So let's apply that to our life. When you have a God-centered vision of life, you believe that God has something special for you to do. You believe that God has a plan for your life. You believe that you are not just a mass of protoplasm. You are not just the result of evolution. You are rather created in the image of God. God has a purpose for your life, that there's something magnificent, that you are in the hand of God. I like to look at uh, a young person and say, God has a plan for your life. That's true for every person in here. Bible says, for God so, oh, that's an important two-letter two word, isn't it? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. A God-centered life begins with a call from God that he has a great purpose for your life that no one but you can fulfill because each individual is a special gift from God. Oh, cherish that. Cherish that thought. God, as we have a new pastor coming in view of a call, you've got a place to serve. There's something for you to do. There's a vision for you in this church field. There's a vision for you in missions. There's a vision for you in Bible study. There's a vision for you in witness. There's a vision for you in teaching the Word of God. There's a vision for you in your family. Everybody needs a mission project. I love Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. Now that, not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, Warren Wiersbe said, never quote those two verses without also quoting verse 10. For we are his workmanship, or one translation says, we are his masterpiece. The Greek word is poema, from which we get the transliteration of the word poem. We're God's workmanship. We're God's masterpiece. We're God's poem. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So the good works is your God-centered life as you surrender your life to the will of God and say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Has God got a call on your life? Now, there's, there's a call to preach. 
There's a call to be a teacher. There's a call to be I, I, a lot of different things in the Bible. The gifts and the calling of God go together. God may be calling you to be the missionary in your home. You may be homeschooling. You may be a school teacher in the public schools. You may be a school principal or you're a nurse. You're where you are is God's mission field for your life. Now, the second thing that uh, happened to Joseph when uh, in his life, we go to chapter 39, verse 9, a God-centered fear of God. That's the second crossroads. Now, his vision got him in trouble. God's call is not often understood by people. People did not understand Jesus, did they? They didn't understand he was the son of God. People didn't understand Moses when he first became the prophet. People didn't understand Noah when he preached for 120 years building that ark. Uh, people didn't understand uh, that the little boy David was going to go out and defeat Goliath. God doesn't understand. Sometimes people don't understand God's call on your life. Joseph was the same way. So his brothers became jealous, and we won't read the passage of what happened to him, but in chapter 37, they, the brothers, the older brothers, I had two older brothers. Any of y'all ever older brother? They ever beat on you? Yeah, okay. Well, you understand that in a nice way. But, you know, these, these brothers did more than beat on Joseph. They hated him. They hated him. And they, he comes with this long coat. His daddy sent him to uh, see them, find them. And here they come up and they see this coat of many colors, this long coat of many colors, and they're angry. And they say, here comes the dreamer. I'm quoting the verse. Let's kill him and see what happens to his dreams. Now, that's what happened in John 1. He was in the world. I'm quoting now. And the world was made by him. and The world knew him not. He came unto his own, the Jews, but his own received him not. They crucified him on a cross. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. So he was sold in slavery, but he was everywhere Joseph went, the Lord was with him. Look at chapter 39, quickly, verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3, the Lord was with him. Verse 3, the Lord made all he did to prosper. Verse 5, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. Joseph was given a job as the head uh, servant over the house of a, of a mighty man of Egypt. I want to say something, and you, you have to apply it to your own individual life. Whatever your job is, do it with all your heart. If you're the custodian in a plant, clean that plant to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Whatever God will give you favor. God will give you his shining love. He will take care of you. Do the best job where you are. I was reading a book on uh, songs, Christian hymns. Do you know what? In the year 1900 in the church, they voted the most popular hymn, H-Y-M-N, the most popular hymn in the church in the year 1900. You know what it was? And we've never heard of it. I've never sung it before. Brighten the corner where you are. Isn't that a great song? Uh, Lauren, you remember singing that in 1900? You, were you here? That's an old song they used to sing. That was the most popular song. It's bright in the corner where you are, bright in the corner where you are. And it's really got a great message. That's what God's calling you to do. Wherever you are, if it's just the corner of a dark room doing a manual labor 12 hours a day, brighten that corner, shine for Jesus wherever you are. Say amen to that. Now, Joseph shined for Jesus. And then he, he got one of those housewives that they talk about on TV, Potiphar's wife. She tempted him. You can read between the lines. You just read the story. Look at verse 8. So Potiphar's wife, while Potiphar, who's Joseph's boss, is gone, and Pot, Joseph's taking care of the house, she said what she shouldn't have said. She tempted him. We won't go any deeper into that. Behold, my master does not know what it is with me in this house. He has committed all things to my hand. There is none greater in the house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but you. And you're his wife. 
And then look at this sentence. This is the hinge upon which the greatness of Joseph stands and turns. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, think about it. He's a 19-year-old man, 18 or 19, maybe. Not, I, I think he's, you'd figured out the chronology. He's 18. He's away from home. No one knows who he is. His parents aren't around. A lot of people want to sow wild oats when they're 18 and then pray for a crop failure, you know, but it, the crops will come. Chickens come home to roost. And what did Joseph do? He could have said, who'll know? He said the greatest words that made all the difference. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, you have on the screen the things that just jumped off the page. He had the fear of God. He ran out of the house. She grabbed his coat. Nothing, no uh, anger like a woman spurned turned down. She was turned down cold by an 18-year-old boy who knew God. Now, you young people, listen to me. You're going to face temptations. You can't fight temptations. You run from temptation. You you resist the devil. You run from temptation. Say amen. Get out of there. Get away from it. Run. Be gone. You're not strong enough. Now, Joseph, there are three or four words up there. He knew his responsibility. There's none greater than I in this house. He had a responsibility. He was grateful. He had gratitude. Potiphar kept back nothing from me but you. He had respect for God's order. You're his wife. I'm not going to violate God's home. He had fear of God's judgment. How can I do this great wickedness? And he believed in the love of God. How can I sin against the God who loved me and grieved the Holy Spirit? That That's the second way you have a God-centered life. You have a fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There is a God. He hates sin, and you want to run from sin because you don't want to be under the disciplined hand of God. He will chasten you, but he will love you even as he does it. Third, God-centered perseverance in trials. Let's fill in the blanks, and I'll try to tell the story as I do. When life has been unfair, we must persevere. Verse chapter 37, 28. They sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. They brought him to, jo- to Egypt. Life was unfair, but Joseph didn't blame God. I'm not telling you anything you haven't already heard, but I'm going to say it right here. Victimization is a cop-out. Yeah, it's been tough. Yeah, you had some bad things happen. Yeah, somebody hurt my feelings at church, and I'm not going back. You know, I had a pastor. I relate to pastors, hundreds of them, in my work with the North American Mission Board. And pastors can be just as petty sometimes, not in percentages, but sometimes. I had a pastor tell me recently, said, I didn't like what the president of this board said, and I'm not going to give any more missions in my church. That's a great attitude, isn't it? That's a horrible attitude. He's a victim. He's a victim. Don't you be a victim. Don't you let what someone has done wrong, and there are hypocrites in the church, there are people that hurt feelings, but you rise above it. You rise above it. You rise above the things that happen. You rise above the things that disappoint you. Joseph rose above it. When doors are closed, we're we're filling in the blanks. We must persevere. Joseph's master took him and put him into prison. He was in that prison for a number of years. When people disappoint us, we must persevere. While he was in prison, of course, Joseph was given favor with God, and he was lifted up and became the the lead trustee there. He was allowed to go all over that prison and minister to people. And there were two people in the prison, the butler and the the baker, uh, put in there by the Pharaoh. And Joseph, again, interpreted dreams, and the dreams came true. And he told the uh, butler, don't forget me. But for two years, the butler forgot him. When God has forgotten us, we must persevere. Now, God didn't forget him. It just seemed that God forgot. We must persevere, and God's time will come. And, he, and look at chapter 41, verse 14. Joseph's been in this prison. 
And believe me, it was not a nice place. It was a dingy dun dungeon down there. Sanitation, no, not in an old Egyptian prison. Finally, the butler remembered his failure. And the Pharaoh had this dream about the seven-year famine and the seven-year blessing and seven-year famine. And Pharaoh was so impressed by what the but butler said. Look at verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and brought him out of the prison. And he shaved himself. Can you imagine what a two-year long beard looked like? Man. And changed his clothes and came in to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I've dreamed a dream. There's nobody that can interpret it. Now, it was the dream about the seven skinny cows eating the seven fat cows. It was about the seven withered ears of corn eating the seven full ears of corn. The, the dream was there'll be seven years of plenty, and then there are going to be seven years of famine. They didn't know what that meant. Joseph didn't either, but it said in verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, here it is. It is not in me. What's the next word? Say it out loud with me. God. That wasn't very good. You don't have your Bibles open. But anyway, verse 16. It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And if you look at verse 25, he interprets the dream in chapter 41. The dream is one God has showed to Pharaoh. Look at verse 28. I will show you what God is about to do. Verse 32, it, the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. And verse 39, as, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has showed you all this, there is none so discreet as you. So here we come. Joseph is now lifted up. If, when we persevere, eventually we will be rewarded. Don't bail out. Don't bail out on your marriage, though it's going tough. Don't bail out on a child that's breaking your heart. Don't bail out on that job. I always tell folks, don't quit a job till you got somewhere else to go. You know, that's a pretty good, pretty good thing to think about. And uh, keep at it. Don't bail out. Walk through the tough times. Keep on walking. Keep, keep on working on your marriage. Keep on working on that job. Keep on working on, on your Christian life. Keep on working on that depression. You know, I know depression's a real thing. Sometimes you just got to get up and keep going. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Go out and work in the yards. If, I'll say this right now. Uh, counts a lot of people with depression. We all go through it. Go out and work up a good sweat every day. I think it helps at least 5%. Just, just go out and sweat real good and work. And forget your problems. Turn them over to Jesus. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep knowing that God one day is going to open that door. One day in heaven, of course, but one day on earth, he'll make it real. God-centered perseverance. Now, chapter 44, very briefly, a God-sized heart of forgiveness. A God-sized heart of forgiveness. Now, the famine, the seven good years came. Now the seven bad years have come. Joseph was wise enough to fill all the granary stores with the corn. They had food to last for seven years. Joseph gave great, uh, sold the food, gave Pharaoh even greater power and greater power. And uh, Finally, Joseph's ten brothers come up looking for food. Now Joseph's now 33 years old. He's the same age Jesus <laughs> And he's in charge of the whole world. He's the prime minister of Egypt. Wow! This is incredible. And he walks out there, and they can't recognize him. He's, he's an Egyptian in his looks now, but he still knew Hebrew. And his brothers come up, and Joseph sees them, and he cries. He goes off and weeps. And then he comes out, and for, a, for these two trips that they came for food, he did not reveal himself. But finally, after... Uh, go read the story. Oh, it's just glorious. It, I always cry. I, I had three brothers. One's, one's gone on before and still love my brothers so much. And even the older ones who I was just their little brother, you know, that preacher boy, little boy. And uh, sometimes they'll say to me, don't talk to me like a preacher. Talk to me like my brother. I said, okay, all right, all right. 
Y'all supposed to laugh at that. That's, that's what preachers go through uh, with the people you grow up with. Uh, and they, they, never, they never forget you're still their little brother. Okay, that's fine. I like it. Having said that, his brothers now had to bow before him. And that dream was fulfilled that he had when he was 17 all those years earlier. And it wasn't for the glory of Joseph. It was that a nation was going to be born. And Joseph then brought all the people of Israel. You know how many there were? Seventy. Seventy. At that point, Joseph then said he forgave his brothers. And his brothers were worried that he would put them to death. He forgave them. He said, I'm I'm not mad at you. And they all came, and in that land of Egypt, those 70 people over the next 400 years grew to be millions of people. God had a plan. Now go to the end of the book. Go to chapter 50, verse 20. I must close. I must close. The last verse we'll look at. A God-centered heart of rest and peace in Christ. Now, Jacob dies. The father's gone, and the brothers are again worried Joseph's going to kill us now and take vengeance. Joseph, however, did not. I want you to write this verse down. Mark it, if not write it down. And let this be a north star for your life. There it is on the screen. He said to his brothers, as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring to pass it is this day to save much people alive. So a God-centered life knows that God is in charge of all things. A God-centered life is a life of joy and peace and believing, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and knowing that God is in charge of all things. He works all things together for good. And that thing that has broken your heart, that has made you bitter, don't get bitter, get better when things happen like this. Joseph didn't get bitter. He just got better. And he named his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh means forgetfulness. Ephraim means fruitfulness. That's how you overcome bad things that happen. You forget it. You lay it aside. You forget it. You've been forgiven. You forgive that person that's broke your heart. And then fruitfulness. Ephraim means fruitfulness. You bear the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, faith. You bear fruitfulness unto Jesus. You give him the glory. He has a plan. I'll close with one other personal story. It means a lot to me. Uh, There's a Hispanic pastor that I got to know years ago, and uh, he served the Lord many, many, many years. You don't need to know his last name, but his first name is Eliab. And I, I said, Eliab, after... We'd have lunch together at the pastor's conference, and he's Hispanic, also uh, speaks English well, of course. And he said, I said, Eliab, that's a Bible name. How did you get it? He said, well, I'll tell you the story. My mother when she was a little Mexican girl in, uh, down in Mexico, and at age 15, she was assaulted. You can fill in the blanks there. The man never knew who the man was, and she had a baby. And in all that time, while she was uh, expecting me, she became a Christian. Got very active in the Baptist church there in Mexico, and, and she was reading her Bible. I was about to be born, Eliab was, and my, my mother was reading the Bible, and she saw that name Eliab, and she heard it preached on and she, wanted, she didn't know who the father of this child was going to be. And she said, if it's a boy, I'm going to name him Eliab. Because you know what Eliab means, Brother Roger? I said, no, what? It says it means God is my father. Amen. Isn't that great? He doesn't know who his father is. The result of the assault of a 15-year-old sweet little Mexican young lady. And she turned him over to God through that trial and named him Eliab said, I don't know who the physical daddy is, but God is this baby's father. That's the way we got to look at life. Amen? It's a God-centered life. And that starts the moment you accept Jesus Christ as Savior. So let's bow our heads in prayer. 
If you've never asked Jesus to save you, you, you can today. Say something like this, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. You died on the cross and shed your blood. I accept you as my Savior, my risen Lord. Help me to come forward and be baptized to tell the world I belong to Jesus, that my name is Eliab. God is my Father. Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. If there's a decision for the Lord, you come right now as we sing. Trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the Sith Thank you, Lauren. Y'all remain standing. We're going to close in prayer here in a moment. And uh, I'll report to you that Will Binkley's doing well. I took him out to breakfast this week, and we had a great time talking. And I tell you, uh, don't tell him I said this, but he's one of the sweetest human beings you will ever meet. I think you already know that. If you don't know him, he's just, uh, you can clap for that. That's fine. I said, now, Will, when you become a pastor and have to make all the decisions, they may forget you're the golden boy that's so sweet. But uh, y'all be nice to him when he's pastor and has to make these decisions you might not agree with. That's, that's the hard thing about being a pastor. You got to make decisions, but you work and you blame it on the deacons. It doesn't work out, but <laughs> just kidding. But, <laughs> but you work with the deacons and you work with the leadership and you work with the committees. But I'm just so impressed by his spirituality. And isn't that the most important thing of all? Your spi- someone's spirituality? And then their preaching uh, really comes after that. And I've, I've, never, I've heard Will preach, and he pre- is a wonderful preacher. But God's got a great big plan, and two, two weeks, three weeks from today, he'll be coming in view of a call next Sunday, Palm Sunday, and Easter. Father, thank you for a great day. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the example of Joseph, who had a God-centered life. Lord, give us all a God-centered life. As we go through this day, whatever happens, we turn to you. In all our ways, acknowledge you, and you'll direct our paths. In Jesus' name, amen. You're you're dismissed. Bible studies right now. God bless you.